Motor specification is important because you need to figure out the right size motor for your application. Sometimes you need more torque, sometimes you need more speed, sometimes you need a transmission, and these are all things that you actually can calculate ahead of time rather than do a guess and check kind of thing. Motor size is determined by the required torque to drive a load. So you calculate static torque, which is for moving at a constant speed, and dynamic torque, which is if you're going to be accelerating. And then include inertial, dissipative, and positional factors. We'll talk about each one of those. This guide assumes direct drive, so that is when the motor and the loader are directly connected. But if the required torque is too big, you can use a transmission, get a mechanical advantage, and then now whatever your transmission ratio is, your motor torque will go down by that much. So in that case, you can use a little motor and the transmission is what will increase your torque. This is a governing equation for it. So sum the torques around the shaft of the motor. So we sum the torques around the motor shaft, then we'll have motor torque minus B theta dot minus C minus D of theta equals I theta double dot. So this is moment of inertia times angular acceleration. And we'll talk about each one of these terms. So if we rearrange and solve for the motor torque, then here we get this equation. And we can see that there is an inertial term. So this is proportional to the acceleration. There's a dissipative term. So this is friction. Um, C is Coulomb friction or stiction. So that's sort of the constant value. And then B theta dot is a damping term. That is friction that's proportional to velocity. And then finally, positional torque. So this actually is going to depend on where the load is relative to the motor. If it is at a big angle or a small angle and how that affects the torque. So we'll discuss each one of these terms. First, the inertial torque. So this is dynamic because it's proportional to acceleration. It's only applicable when the system is accelerating. So at startup or at slowdown or when you're changing directions. Generally, the theta double dot will be a constant value and that's something that you choose. So you choose constant value for your acceleration, which do that, you know, rather than have variable acceleration will make it way easier on yourself. Then velocity is going to be linear. So it'll ramp up from zero to whatever. And then your position is going to follow a parabolic curve. I is mass moment of inertia. So that has units of kilograms times meters squared. It includes two things, the motor inertia and the load inertia. So the motor inertia is JM. You can get that from the data sheet. It'll actually say JM equals and then give you a number. Then to find the load inertia, you can evaluate it for any shape using integration. Or you can just approximate the objects as basic shapes using standard formulas. So you probably remember learning about this one in physics and dynamics. You know, if you have a rod rotating around axis or if you have a disc or whatever, there are standard formulas. Now, if the mass is not actually on the axis of the motor, but it's somewhere further out, then you use parallel axis theorem, where total moment of inertia is the centroidal, which is what we got here or looked up in the table, plus m times d squared, where m is the mass and d is the distance away from the axis of rotation. So an example of this would be if your motor is driving a platform and there's a weight on the platform. So the motor would be along on one edge of the platform. It moves like a lever and then the load would be further out that you're trying to lift. So that's a case where you would use parallel axis theorem. 
Here's an example of that. Adding individual moments of inertia to obtain total system inertia. So in this case, we have the motor right here. So we've got JM for the motor. And then we have a platform. The platform's not gonna be massless, so we'll, we can find mass of the platform. And then that inertia is one third ML squared for a rod rotating around an axis that on its, that's on its end. So this is the platform term. And then for the object, we have to use the parallel axis theorem because its center of mass is removed from the axis of rotation. So the object, that's subscript O, we would have to get moment of inertia of the object around its centroid. And then that's the one you could look up in the table. And then we have to add MO times that distance away squared. This is basically just treating the object as itself, which is centroid, plus being a point mass that's somewhere away. So this is the formula for point mass moment of inertia. If the object were small enough and concentrated enough that it didn't really have a moment of inertia around the center, then you'll just have the MD squared term, which is for a point mass. The angular acceleration, theta double dot, is something that you choose depending on how you want your system to behave. So to choose it, you have to know two of the following things. Desired steady state speed, the distance that you would turn through to reach that speed, or maximum time to reach that speed. So you figure out how fast you want to be going, and then you use one of these formulas. So if you want your motor to reach a certain speed after it's turned through like 90 degrees, you could use this formula. Or you might say, we want the motor to reach that speed after three seconds. In that case, you would use this formula. And both of these can be derived using uh, the, from the constant acceleration equations. So here we know we can check units. So this is going to be in radians per second squared. So radians per second, seconds gets radians per second squared. And same thing here, radians on the bottom just kind of vanishes and then we have radians per second squared. The dissipative torque, this one is from friction, so it will always be against you. This will be in any system and generally it's determined experimentally and it can even change over time. So you might start out with some really great bearings and you have your lubricant on there and everything's turning smoothly. And then over time, you start to get just a little bit more friction, things wear out, this goes up. So because of the experimental determination, because it changes, you wanna give your motor kind of safety factor. So you'll have to either kind of estimate it um, or you just give yourself a real big safety factor if there's no way that you can figure it out. So B is the damping coefficient. And this the damping term is proportional to velocity. So if the system's moving faster, you will have more damping than if the system is moving slower. An example of damping is like a slow closed door. Um, and also something like wind resistance, fluid resistance, drag, those kinds of things have damping. So if you're using hydraulics, you will probably need to account for this. If you're using pneumatics, there's not a whole lot. Then the Coulomb friction or stiction, this is a constant value. So it's just proportional to the friction coefficient and the normal force. This is the kind of friction that you're used to calculating. So you can estimate it using that friction coefficient mu between the specific surfaces. And if you find the force, combine that with the motor distance to find the frictional torque. It's internal, you can measure it experimentally. There's an article here that has a link on how to do that. But in general, you just kind of 
do give your best estimate and put a safety factor on it. So if you were going to measure it experimentally, then you would do an experiment where you measure torque at, while you're moving at different speeds when there's no load. And then you can get the line. So you would have basically torque equals B theta dot plus C. And then this is going to be the slope of the line. This is going to be the Y intercept as you, if you plot torque versus speed should get a linear relationship like this. Now you have to do that at steady state when there's no load. Otherwise you will have some dynamic factors in there and you won't get a linear relationship. For example, how to calculate the friction on a conveyor. Fri the friction on the pulley, so say this is the conveyor belt and this is the pulley. Friction will cause unequal belt tension. So if there's no friction, it's great. You have it's taut on the top, taut on the bottom, moving at a nice constant speed. Now for maximum friction, it's taut on the top and it is super slack on the bottom. So in that case, tension is not gonna be equal and the friction is gonna be force times distance uh, to get torque. So this is the worst case scenario. So you get the C value, belt tension times pulley radius. Now, if it's the worst than that, you have bigger problems. You probably need to figure out what is going on with your system or maybe your, the design is just bad. Final term is the positional torque. So we call this D of theta. So D as a function of theta, not D times theta. Torque is a function of load position. For dynamic loads, the torque depends on the load angle. So if it's changing, if your motor angle is changing and then the positional torque will depend on the angle. But in some case, like for a static load, the torque is just gonna be weight times distance from axis. So examples here for dynamic load, if you're dumping a bin, opening a flap, angling a platform, you can see here motor torque, you just draw the free body diagram, find the torque, so this is going to be mass times gravity, which is the force, times that horizontal distance, which is d cosine theta. So you can see max torque is going to be when theta is zero, when this platform is straight down. And then as it rises, the positional torque decreases until, if you're right here at theta is 90 degrees, then there's actually no positional torque because the load is all going straight down through the motor shaft. Now for a more static load, example here is a rack and pinion. You can see that as the motor turns, the pinion turns, the pinion is this round one, and the rack will move up and down. So the weight is going to be the same distance away from the axis all the time. In this case, it doesn't actually depend on theta because no matter what is the position of the motor, the distance of the load away from that axis of rotation, it's constant. It's always going to be R. So rack will move vertically and the pinion will spin. So in this case, we're just going to have force times distance, so mass gravity times R, where R is the distance from the center of the motor to the load. Now back to the governing equation. Sum all the torques determine the net motor torque. So this is the maximum torque that your motor will require. To find that maximum torque, you want to know what's going to be the acceleration you need, your max speed, friction, your max positional torque. So if you throw all that in there, then you'll get max torque that your motor needs to, to use. 
most of the time your motor won't need quite that much torque because your load is position dependent. You know, sometimes d of theta will be bigger or less. If your motor is moving at constant speed, theta double dot will go to zero, so it will have no inertial torque. So finding the maximum torque will help ensure that you get the right size motor that can handle whatever your system is going to do. Generally, once you find that value, you'll multiply it by three or so to get a safety factor. Just in case there's more friction than you thought, or you end up with a bigger load than you thought, or something like that. Now, if the required torque is too high, you can use a transmission. So that would be like a gearbox, or you, you can buy a gearbox that has a certain transmission ratio. It will tell you something like 96 to 1, and then that means you get 96 times as much torque as your motor puts in. Now the caveat here is that if torque goes up, speed goes down for constant power, because power is torque times speed. So if you're using a gearbox, just know that you'll have to either run your motor a lot faster or your load will be moving a lot slower than if there was just the motor on it. Other examples are gear train, belt and pulleys, chain and sprockets. These are all ways that you can increase your torque. It has the side effect of decreasing speed.